Hello guys, welcome back to yet another episode of Sam's Motoring Machine. And in this episode, it's time to throw all of this service stuff at the Range Rover and see what sticks. So I've been building up a bit of a stock of service items for the Range Rover over the last few weeks. It's due an engine oil and filter change. We've also got these two air filters for the engine. A diesel filter, of course. An oil filter for the engine, as I mentioned. And a cabin filter as well. All of these by Marla. And Marla, I believe, is the OEM manufacturer for filters for, for Land Rovers of this age. It's either that or man. Can't quite remember which, but... Anyway, I think this is decent gear and it should be fine for, for my purposes. The engine oil I've gone with is this Valvoline Sinpower 5W30 synthetic oil. Um, it's nothing special, quite cheap really, but the main thing about it is that it meets the spec that Land Rover requires for DPF equipped vehicles, which is a low SAPS formula to make sure we don't gum up our DPF. I'm of the mindset that frequent oil changes with a cheaper oil are better than longer service intervals with a really expensive oil. That's just what I think is better for the engine on, on the whole. Um, obviously you could use expensive oil and change it frequently, but that's a pretty expensive way to go about things. I think using a cheaper oil like this and then changing it every six to 8,000 miles is probably the way to go. That's what I do anyway. As well as the engine service, we've got this Castrol Transmax manual 75W90 oil, which is for the diffs. And we've also got some Febby TF1, which is a special oil for the transfer box on these Range Rovers. I'll put the recommended spec that Land Rover give on the screen right now, because I can't remember it off the top of my head, but this stuff meets that spec and exceeds it, so, so this will work absolutely fine in our transfer box. Anyway, as I've just been to the boot fair, the engine is nice and warm, so I'm going to get started with the engine oil. So last time I changed the oil on the Range Rover, about 12 months ago, I drained it out the bottom of the sump by disconnecting the quick connector oil return on the bottom of the sump. And while that works fine, that's not actually the way that Land Rover recommend you do it on these engines. As is the case with a lot of modern engines, they actually recommend that you suck it out using a suction pump. So for today, I've actually bought myself a new toy and got one of these nine litre oil suction pumps off of Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description below for this, but we're gonna see how good it is now when I use it for the first time. So let's give it a go. This unit comes with four different lengths of pipes of different thickness. And actually, one of them is actually a copper pipe, which I can't quite work out what that's for. Perhaps it's something to do with brake lines, but again, I can't really work out why this pipe would need to be copper. The other three pipes they give you are actually pretty short as well. So I've lowered the Range Rover suspension down as much as I can, and hopefully that's going to be enough to let me get the pipe on while keeping this on the floor. So from what I've seen on some L322 engines, the suction, kit, the suction pipe for the engine oil is actually located underneath the filler cap. When you open the filler cap, you'll see it in there. But on the 4.4 TDV8, it's separate. It's actually just in front of the filler cap here. And you pull this plug off, and that's your suction pipe there. So I'll take that off, see which one of those connectors fits it best, and start pumping, see what happens, I guess. So I've gone for the thickest pipe they supplied here because it's the only one that actually fits over that connection. And as you guys can see, it's not really long enough. It could do with being about another foot longer, really. So I guess now there's nothing for it but to start pumping, see what happens. There it comes. Just have to make sure there's a good connection. And that is actually coming out pretty nicely now. Wow. Sucking with some force. Ah, I don't think it was sucking air in there. And this, by the sound of that gurgling and sucking noises, it sounds like we've actually reached the bottom of the sump on the uh, Range Rover, which is good. I was slightly worried it wasn't all going to fit in this thing, but... Yeah, that sounds pretty empty to me in there, which is good. 
that was actually really easy, worked pretty well. The only, literally the only thing I would improve on that would be to give a longer, more flexible pipe and then you'd be, you'd be on a winner then. I guess the only important part now is to get the pipe disconnected without splattering oil everywhere. Which seems to be okay. That's the first time I've used one of these suction pumps and let me tell you, it beats uh, scrabbling around on the gravel trying to pull out the stump plug and then getting oil down your sleeve when you finally get it out. I think I'm a convert. Another good thing about having a container like this is it means we can transfer that waste oil back into the new tubs once they're empty um, so we can dispose of the oil, so ideal. And the oil filter on these is a cartridge type and it's located right in the center of the engine right here on top. So uh, again, you don't even have to scrabble underneath to get to this one. Hopefully I've got a socket that fits the top of this filter housing because um, that'll make it a lot easier to get it out without uh, resorting to straps and stuff like that. So let's have a look. So there we go guys, it's a 36 mil socket for future reference. This is a three quarter inch drive socket that I've got here. Um, and unfortunately I don't have my three quarter inch drive set here. So I'm gonna have to use, get a bit medieval on it and use some Stilsons on top of the socket to undo it, but uh, no harm done. The way these filters work is that when you unscrew the cap, it actually lets the oil drain from the bottom of the oil filter housing. So once it's done that, I'll probably put the pump back on the suction uh, fitting again to see if I can suck out the remainder of that oil that's gonna drop down when we take this fill when we take this oil uh, filter cap off. There you go guys. Nice and black as you'd expect after eight thousand miles in a big diesel like this. Definitely time for a change. To see if we get any more pumps out of it. Yeah, it does sound like there's a bit more coming. Yeah, there was, there was definitely at least one extra sort of pump in there uh, after I released that oil filter, so uh, probably should have done that first really, so you get the full amount of oil in the sump when you're, when you're pumping it out. But there we go. So we've made sure we've got all the oil out of the engine now. So this filter actually comes with three O-rings. I'm not sure what these two smaller ones are actually for. I'll have to look it up in a minute maybe, but uh, the main one we actually need for this oil filter change is this large one, which goes around the outside of the filter housing itself there. So we'll get that changed over now. So we're just gonna pull this old oil seal out. Discard that. Take our new seal. Stretch that over. correct groove like that so new oil filter looks slightly different than what came out but uh, it's definitely the right part number I've checked it, it has slightly different top and bottom uh, orifices than the original one but it should be the one we need so there we go that is the oil filter successfully changed over if you're doing it by the book and you have the correct tools, this should be done up to 27 Newton meters. I just did it by feel and it's definitely tight enough. It shouldn't come undone. We shouldn't have any leaks, fingers crossed. So. so the next job is to throw some engine oil back into the engine. The official oil capacity for this engine is 9.5 liters in total. So we're gonna go ahead and throw this first five liters in without even checking the level. Hopefully getting it, hopefully getting it into the Filler next, I don't have my, actually this is quite, be quite difficult. There we go, only a minor spillage. Once this is done, I'm gonna start looking at the diesel filter next, I think. Possibly air filters as well, because it might be easier to do the diesel filter once the air filter boxes are out of the way. We'll have a look in a minute. But for now, let's concentrate on getting this oil into the filler neck. Okay, there's our first five litres in. 
And then on the second bottle, I think what I'm going to do is go for about three and a half litres out of this one to start off with, which should take us to eight and a half litres. And eight and a half litres, I think, should take us to the minimum level on the digital oil uh, level gauge. So we'll go for that for a start. Leave her to settle for a few minutes and then start her up and see what she says. About another half a litre to go. So I started up, sounds pretty nice. We're going to let it run for about five to ten minutes and then we're going to follow the Land Rover procedure for checking the oil using the digital gauge on the dash because there is no physical dipstick, of course. I think the leaks around the filter, nothing there. Sounds lovely. It sure always sounds the nicest right after an oil change with that nice thick fresh oil running around. Whilst we've got our idling, you guys might be able to hear that tick, 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 tick noise coming from the front and here. It almost sounds like it's coming from the radiator. I just stopped now, but, but that noise is the cause of quite a few different questions and uh, posts on forums and stuff like that, people asking what it is. It actually comes from the viscous fan coupling and, uh, and some people say it's a normal noise for them to make and other people say it's a noise they make when they're about to fail. But I do know somebody that actually replaced their viscous fan because of that noise and after a couple of weeks the noise came back again. So. From my point of view, it's probably a pretty normal noise and uh, doesn't seem to affect the operation of the fan in any way. Okay, now she's been sat idling away for five or ten minutes, it's time to turn off and then we're going to go inside the cab and we're going to check the oil level using the London River procedure, so let's go and do that now. So in order to check the oil level now, after we've just done that first top up, we're going to put the ignition on. You've got to have the bonnet open for this step for it to work. Uh, we're going to clear these messages using the right hand button, go into the service menu open up the oil level display and it's going to tell us that it can't actually, oh there you go, my mistake, it's actually given us an oil level there straight away. Sometimes if you don't get an oil level there straight away you can press the cruise control cancel button twice and it should give you a display of the engine oil there. Um, so that's telling us the oil is okay, it's not at the top at the max, uh, it's kind of a couple bars below so that's probably not a bad place to leave it and what I'll do is I'll run the car around for a day or two and then check it again and top it up if it needs it but for now that's fine for us. Happy days. So the next one we're going to do are these air filters, of which there are two on the 4.4 TDV8, only one on the 3.6. There we go, like that. Tuck him out of the way. And then we're going to go ahead and I think I can probably get this filter changed without taking any of the pipe work off. So there's six Phillips head screws around the perimeter that need to come out. Have to come out all the way just enough so that they disconnect from the lower filter housing. Service time is always a pretty good time to have a look around your engine bay as well when you're doing things like this just to see if you can notice any pipes or wires or anything that looks out of the ordinary like it's uh, like it might rub or it's you know just to give yourself that little early warning signs of uh, any failure that might be impending. So I think we're going to have to take off this elbow as well just to get it, get the top of the filter housing right out the way. So I'm going to grab a tool for that. Okay, and that should allow the whole filter housing to come up and out the way, which it does, revealing our right side air filter in here. Now this is the one that actually gets most of the use on 4.4 TDV8, so you usually find that it's the dirtiest, which this one is. So unlike on the 3.6 TDV8, where both turbos are working all the time in a twin turbo setup, on the 4.4 TDV8 it's actually a parallel sequential setup and what that means in simple terms is that this turbo on this side of the engine is working the whole time and the turbo on the left hand side of the engine only comes in when you're over a certain RPM range so say around 2,500 RPM that turbo kicks in and that's when that left hand air filter starts going into use so I expect when we take that filter out it'll be a lot cleaner than this. Now 
new filter, it looks a lot better. Usually, usually you need to hoover out the air box a bit, but there's nothing in there in, the, in this case, it's nice and clean. So we will drop the filter straight back in. Pop this guy back into place. It's a bit annoying that Land Rover used screws on these. I mean, every other manufacturer for years has been using those clips. That means it's a lot quicker of a job, but... Oh well. And then lastly, pop this guy back on for the MAF sensor. Happy days. That right-hand side of the engine bay was the easy one. This left one is a bit more tricky. Uh, not too bad, though. So we've got these guys on top, which are actually the glow plug uh, relays. So they need to come out of the way first before we can get into this filter. So there's just a single 8mm bolt that holds this bracket on that these guys sit on top of. So we'll take him out. Careful not to lose that. And then this should wiggle, 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 wiggle and pull out of the way of there. So we can just tuck that up on top of the uh, fuel cooler there so we can get at this filter. I'm expecting this filter to be pretty much brand new when I get this out. Um, especially since I very rarely exceed 2,500 RPMs with the Range Rover. But, good thing to check it. Okay. As I kind of expected, this filter pretty much looks brand new, save for a few little bits of uh, muck in there. So we can probably keep this as a spare. Um, can't think why we'd ever need one, but so but might be useful to keep one on the shelf. Now I'm actually going to pull this lower part of the uh, filter housing out because it's just a simple push-in design and that makes it a lot easier to get to the fuel filter. So the next step is to remove this big locking ring which can be really really tight so if you've got a big pair of uh, adjustable grips like I've got here you can use them um, otherwise you're just going to have to uh, man up I'm afraid. You want to twist it that way towards the bulkhead of the car, which should unlock the filter housing. It should drop off the bottom. And then the filter housing itself should just drop down like that with a few more drips of fuel. The bottom of this new filter has actually got a plug in here which we need to remove um, and, a, and a new seal as well, this washer, which will need to be placed on that, that uh, water separator plug at the bottom um, when, we've, when we've installed it back in. So uh, yeah, let's get it, let's get it on and then I will uh, then I'll show you that bit in a minute. So I'm gonna put the uh, cap over the bottom of it. Get it lined up. Push that in, and it should actually only go in on one orientation on this on this vehicle. I don't think if you put it if you tried to put it in turn, it wouldn't actually go into the uh, housing. And then on the locking ring itself is an arrow which shows you the position it should be in. So we're going to start off with it up here. And once you've got this located correctly, you'll feel it pulling up as you lock it round into the lock position. Like that. So that filter is now fully locked in place. And then this new o-ring just needs to drop over that thread on the uh, water separator drain at the bottom. So then we can put that back up its spout, start tightening that up, thread it in. Just tighten that up until it seals nicely against that rubber washer. Like that. Very nice. Next we're going to throw this air filter housing back in the hole again. Making sure it mates up with the rubber boot on the inside of the wing properly. And 
that should be that. So that's the lower part of the housing in. Now we can throw our new filter in here. Very nice. Put more nice dirty greasy fingerprints on it already. And then top part of the housing. Making sure that air pipe connects properly. Okay, now I'll just go ahead and do all those screws up. You guys don't need, don't need to see me do that. So that's that back together again. Now just we need now all we need to do is chuck these guys back where they live. Slide that down into their bracket there. Put the bolt back in there, which I carefully saved and didn't lose. And there we have it. Now as this has had a new filter on it and all that diesel's drained out, it'll obviously need to be bled before the engine can run properly. And this 4.4 TDV, I think a 3.6 as well, is a self-bleeding system. So all we should need to do is turn the ignition on, wait for 60 seconds, and it should prime the system itself automatically. So uh, we'll see how that goes in a minute. This is definitely the most important item on today's service list though. This has got to be the most sunshine I've ever seen in one day in Ireland so far. So to get at it, all we're going to do is pull off the seal across the back of the engine bay, get our 13mm spanner, take out these guys here. Not somewhere safe, and then pull this guy out. And we just need to pull this filter out of the enclosure. So it's actually pretty dirty. That's all the crap that the uh, filter stops from blowing into the cabin when you're driving along. That's what it should look like. And that's what it looks like now. And you don't actually need to fully remove this part in order to get the filter. You can just open this flap here, but I wanted to take it out. Firstly, just to give it a bit of a clean out because it's a bit mucky in there. And also just so I can have a peek down the back of the engine and inspect down there because there are a couple of places down there which are notorious for oil leaks on these engines. So it's always good to just have a quick bit of a poke around whilst we're, whilst we're in here. I'll tell you what, I'll get the GoPro and show you guys what I'm looking at. So if you guys can see down there, you can actually see the bell housing of the gearbox there. And there are a couple of pipes at the top here which can leak from O-rings that connect into the oil cooler on top of the engine. And if they're leaking, you'll generally see kind of an oil slick on top of that gearbox bar housing there. And at the moment that all looks pretty dry to me, so that's pretty good. Yeah, pretty happy with that. And you can see these two big holes in the bulkhead here where the air for the HVAC system would enter the car. So I've given this airbox a bit of a blowout now. This can be now slid back into position. Very nicely so. Just put our nuts back on. So that should be us finished under the bonnet now. Uh, I think what we should do now is probably put the ignition on and see if it'll bleed that fuel up and see if we can get it started again. So the Land Rover service manual for this process of changing the diesel filter on one of these cars is literally just to, once you've changed the filter, put the ignition on and wait for 60 seconds for it to bleed the fuel through. So let's give it a go, I guess. The ignition's on. Let's head around to the front, see if we can hear any fuel moving around. Yeah, there we go. That's that telltale sound of uh, air being flushed out of the system as the fuel, new fuel filter fills up. Hopefully you guys can hear that. So it sounds like it might have finished bleeding. But uh, what I might do is just give it one more ignition cycle off, off and on again just to make sure it's bled up before we start and then give her a start up. Make sure she runs all right. So ignition off again. Ignition on. It's 
let it do a bit more pumping. And I think we should go for a start now. There we go. Started right up, not a problem in the world. So there we go, that's all the stuff sorted under the one at the Range Rover for this year's service. I'm probably gonna try and do it again at 8,000 miles or so. Uh, I think that's probably about the right sort of service interval for this. The diesel filter and the air filters, I think are actually on a longer service interval than the engine oil and oil filter. Um, so I'll check the original uh, documentation that I've got for this and see what, um, see what the recommended intervals for those are. But yeah, happy with that, that's all good. Right, now on to the next stuff. So in the ID tool, I'm going to go into height adjust mode, and then I've got like a 25mm lift setting here, which I'm going to apply to the car now, um, just to give me a bit more room underneath. So that's applied, and it should, in theory, start to lift itself up again now. There we go. She's up. She's going. And there we are. Now I... Now we're now at off-road height in my extended 25mm lifted site, uh, setting, so loads of room underneath. Right, let's get under it. So you now join me underneath the back of the Range Rover, looking at the rear diff. And as I know I'm going to get comments about being squashed under the Range Rover, I have put these... Uh, Axle stands in either side just to stop the Range Rover from coming down on top of me if it decides it wants to kill me. So here we go, that's the drain plug for the rear diff. But obviously, most important rule of changing any kind of transmission or diff oil is to make sure you can get the fill plug out before you take out the drain plug, because otherwise you might end up with no oil left in your diff at all and then you'd be stuck. So let's just make sure I can to this. So that is a, what do we end up with, an 8mm Allen in there. Nice snug fit, so see if we can crack him off. <laughs> oh. yeah. That is moving. So that's nice and loose now, and we can safely take out the drain plug, knowing that we're not going to be stuck with no oil in our diff. So we can now see about getting this drain plug out, which is just a 3 8 sized extension fit in there. It's really awkward to do. Okay, not too tight. Okay, just gonna get my handy dandy screen wash bottle to drain it into. What's the bit? And I get diff oil all the way down my uh, arm now. Whee! Okay, so I got a fair bit on my shoulder, but not too bad. That actually looks really clean. Oh well, good thing to change it anyway. So we'll let that drain, and then I'll come back to when I'm filling back up again. So whilst my glamorous assistant fills up the uh, pump for me, I'm just going to put the drain plug back in again. These don't have to be done up too tight. Just a bit of a, probably about a three grunt. Not even a three grunt, a two grunt. Yeah. Something like that. Give him a bit of a dry off. Right, so I'll try and put my filler, my little pump bottle, into there, like that, and then, Wow, shut up. 
and then hopefully we can just pump this through. Tighten that back up and that'll be the rear diff. Done. Oh my ass. <laughs> Full post ramp. When we have a house, of course we can. It's <laughs> not right now in a rental. Oh, so nice. <laughs> so we're at the front diff now, and you can just see the drain plug there. And just up there in that gap, you can see the filler plug as well. And both of these are 14 mil Allens, so it's the same for, for fill and drain on the uh, on the front. So unfortunately, I haven't got a 14 mil socket, but I do have a 14 mil allen wrench so it's not ideal but i'll just put the allen key in there and obviously because it's so stiff to turn i'll just put a spanner over the end here and use it like a oh to try and give me a bit more leverage to get that undone okay so this is now fairly loose which is good i can now undo the drain plug so I took that uh, second under tray off because it makes it a lot easier to get onto this uh, drain plug. Um, that's just three little 10 mil screws on mine. I think quite a couple of them have been lost, so it's probably supposed to be more than that, but 10, 10 on mine, three on mine, sorry. So now I need my Allen key, which I've lost again. There it is, which can go in there. I'm gonna have to use our extendo spanner again. Pretty stiff. It's almost certainly going to end up not going in the tub. Unfortunately, just because of the angle it's at. But well, give it a go. Ready. Ready. Hey. Oh. oh my God, that's really black in the front. Jesus, that stuff really need, needed uh, changing for sure. That's a horrible colour. Mm. Grim. Yeah. I think I caught most of it. Bit of uh, sludge on the on the magnet, but not too bad. To be expected after 200,000 miles. These plugs are always a tapered thread, so it gets tighter and tighter the more you go in with it. It's very clever. How do they do that? They just make it closer together the higher up on the nut it goes. The threads just go, go narrower as it gets towards the bottom of the, um, the hole, and the plug just gets wider towards the top, so it sort of seals it as you, as you tighten it in. pretty tight. Diff oils don't get any contamination in like engine oil does from carbon and stuff but it does kind of get little bits of wear coming off of the gears itself like bits of uh, very small bits of metal grinding off over time so I guess that's what that colour is. Yeah nice. Oh, into there, there we go. <clears throat> okay there we go I got right. you in the shot as well. <laughs> getting muck in my eyes. Sorry, right, Mitchell. so the hook is in the hole. So now I'll just commence pumping. There we go. There should be 0.75 litres going into this front diff. So last job of the day is a transfer box and we've just got two 8mm Allen key drain and fill plugs, both the same on this. This is the fill plug at the top. Oh. So that's nice and loose. We can get this guy out now. Oh. 
yeah, they're uh, snapping loose pretty easy. Right, uh, can I have the drain tub, please? Perfect. Oh, that's black. Is it black, black? Yeah. It's real black. Well overdue. Quite a bit more oil in this than in the diffs. Just, oh shit. And then we got 1.5 litres to fill this back up. So quite a bit of pumping. should be about 1.5 litres in there now. So that's just filled until it's just started slightly overflowing so the plug can go back in now. <laughs> and that'll do. Badly. I've been meaning to do that engine oil change for quite a while now and uh, it's quite a bit overdue really. <clears throat> Ideally, I'd like to try and change the engine oil every six to 8,000 miles, but in this case, it'd actually been more like 10,000 miles since I last changed it. So hopefully it won't leave, won't leave it that long next time. The diff and transfer box oils were really black, actually way worse than I thought they would be. Uh, God knows when they were last changed, but yeah, they were definitely in need of doing, so I'm glad they've been done now. I was actually really impressed by that oil suction pump that I bought and uh, again I'll leave a link in the description below for you guys to uh, check it out on Amazon um, but yeah that made the engine oil change a lot easier than uh, scrubbing around underneath uh, and trying to, trying to drain it out of the sump. As for the diff oils and the transfer box oils well in the absence of a four post lift we did have to scrub around on the ground to change those um, which on our, on our gravel drive isn't the most comfortable thing to do in the world but it's not too bad. I'm actually on my way now to go and top up with fuel because as I'm sure it's the same where you guys live, the diesel prices and petrol prices are going absolutely crazy at the moment due to the uh, world events that are going on. So uh, this place that I'm going to tends to update their prices a lot slower than everywhere else on the bigger garages. So uh, yeah, hopefully I can top the tank up uh, at a fairly reasonable price today. The Range Rover is driving really nicely though after all that servicing. The engine does just seem that little bit uh, smoother and quieter with a nice fresh oil in it. I know I can't really say I've ever felt any problem with the diffs or transfer box with that, that old oil in. Um, I'm sure that with the new oil in everything we're running that nice bit smoother as well. So uh, yeah, feeling good. Please make sure you subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.